Good to be here for another Sabbath. It's been a hard week for some <coughs> some people, has, hasn't it? The uh, the Websters have had a hard week. Ken Curtis has had a hard week too. Been uh, digging drains. It worked right in with the chip program because it uh, tightened up these stomach muscles, tensed up the arm muscles, made the wrist muscles stiff, and to get that vibrato on the violin was a bit difficult today because I've been digging all the week to dig up a drain that... Uh, uh, became a little um, stubborn down at the church house there. And uh, anyway, today we can come here and enjoy the Sabbath. I've entitled the sermon, When Standing Tall is Bowing Low. So I hope, if you remember nothing else, that you'll think about the title uh, of this uh, sermon when standing tall is bowing low. If you've got your Bible, you might like to turn to Daniel and the third chapter because uh, this is a story that uh, everybody loves and uh, the children particularly like this story. Just turn this upwards a little bit. I think that'll catch me a little bit better there. <clears throat> so we're in Daniel chapter 3. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits and the breadth thereof six cubits and he set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. So if you want to be in feet, you're talking this uh, great uh, statue is something like about 90 feet high and uh, it's, uh, if you're talking in metres, you're going to be talking around about 27 metres high. So uh, it's something to be noticed. And this could be seen, they tell me, if you were uh, at some distance across the plains uh, there on near the Euphrates River, um, it could be seen from 80 kilometres away. Um, the top of it could be seen with the sun shining on it from 80 kilometres away. Now, that's uh, a bit of uh, probably tradition or something like that, but uh, it's logical enough. Nebuchadnezzar, the king, set together together the princes, the governors, and the captains, and the judges, and the treasurers, and the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar, the king, had set up. So he had all the important people there. They were all gathered together to uh, dedicate this image. <coughs> Then the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the councillors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces were gathered together unto the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up, and they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Notice it even tells you how they presented themselves. They stood before the image. Then a herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages, that at that time you hear the sound of the cornet and the flute and the harp, the sack, but the psaltery, the dulcimer and all kinds of music, you should fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. And whoso will not fall down and worship shall that same hour be cast into the middle of a burning fiery furnace. Therefore, at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, and all kinds of music, all the people, the nations and the languages, fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. This bunch of instruments here must have made quite a choir, mustn't it? Quite an orchestra. They were a bit of a funny bunch to all put together, but uh, we understand that these uh, instruments were the instruments pertaining to the particular nations which Nebuchadnezzar had conquered. And, of course, out of all those, we noticed the harp particularly, and the harp was the instrument that pertained to the Jews. And so when the cornet and the flute and all these different instruments sounded, the people who uh, identified with those instruments were to bow down and worship. So there'd be a whole bunch over here that perhaps came from Assyria. They would bow down when one instrument played and then another bunch over here would bow down when their instrument played. 
I don't know what the National Instrument of New Zealand is if we were to uh, have such a thing today. I don't know quite what we would use, but uh, whatever, they were to bow down. But when it came to the sound of the harp, that gentle, soft, soothing sound of the harp, there were some people there who didn't bow down because the harp represented the Jewish people. Wherefore at that time, verse 8, certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews. They spoke and said to the king Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man shall hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, and the dulcimer, and all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever does not fall down and worship, that he should be cast into the middle of the burning fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon. They are Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not your gods, nor worship the golden image which you have set up. So here were three people standing. Three people standing out on the plain when they should have fallen down. Three people standing when hundreds of others were fallen down and bowed before this image. Those people probably fell down on their knees and their elbows with their faces on the ground. You see, the whole object of this thing was not just to dedicate an image, it was to dedicate Nebuchadnezzar. Because Nebuchadnezzar had been through an experience with Daniel not long before where Daniel had explained to him that he was the head of gold, and it's all there in Daniel chapter 2, he was the head of gold of another image, an image which portrayed a change of nations down through time, going right down to the end of time. But Babylon was represented by the head of gold, and in particular, Nebuchadnezzar. And this must have tickled Nebuchadnezzar's fancy. I can imagine him getting quite excited by that. Wouldn't it be nice to say that you have a head of gold? I don't have a head of gold anymore. Mine's pretty silver. But to have a head of gold, even today, even if it's only talking about your hair, is, is marvellous. Now, I remember our daughter had a head of gold. and Our daughter had a beautiful hair and still has, I suppose. But uh, her hair was, uh, was magnificent hair and it uh, shone beautifully in the light. But to talk about a whole head of gold, not just the hair, the whole head of gold, is uh, flattering. And Nebuchadnezzar was flattered, and he didn't seem to get the picture entirely. And he thought to himself, in any case, that if he's the head of gold, he must be important enough to be taken notice of. And so he set up an image and this image represented Nebuchadnezzar, not just a head of gold, but the whole lot of gold. He was getting a bit bold about the whole business, pretty cheeky actually, and he was saying to himself, I'm more than just a head, the whole lot of me is gold. There's never going to be another nation after me. Gold is from tip to toe. Babylon is here forever. Nebuchadnezzar is here forever. Something else comes up here as well. You need to know something about the mindset of the people of those days to quite understand what Nebuchadnezzar was on about. Remember that Nebuchadnezzar worshipped various gods, which are not gods, but uh, he worshipped uh, <coughs> Baal and probably uh, Ashtaroth and, uh, and various other gods. And uh, these gods represented or were represented by the different uh, uh, worlds, if we call them worlds, out there in the universe, different stars. And uh, <coughs> he would have believed, and clearly did believe, that he was in his position because his favourite God had put him there. And if his favourite God had put him in a position where he was the head of gold, the head of the world, then uh, he was as well as being the head of gold, he was himself a god. He had descended from the gods. 
there's still some of this kind of thinking around in the world today. And if you were to go to Tibet, for example, and some of those places up in uh, those areas there, there are people who still believe that they are there because they are a god. And they are a god impersonated. He believed that he was a god. And if he was a god, he was entitled not just to have a head of gold, but to have a whole body of gold. So really what he was doing was saying, you people, when you hear this music, when your national anthem plays, you bow down to me because I am God. This, of course, is the whole basis of something that today we call humanism. I am really God. It's something that has the basis of new ageism. I am God. And if I look inside myself, sufficiently and if I do this and I do that and I meditate the right way and so on I will come to recognize that I am really God myself I am my own little God it's in some religions that even call themselves Christian religions and if you go to the depth of some of their thinking it uh, it reveals that they believe that one day we will become a God in our own right and we will be able to set up our own world out there in space and be independent beings entirely from any other uh, god at all. We will become gods. You see, this was uh, some of the thinking at the Tower of Babel. If they could make a tower that would go beyond the ability of God to flood them out, then they themselves would be gods. They would be bigger than God. Nebuchadnezzar was bigger than any other god that he imagined anyhow. And so his towering uh, image there, whether it was uh, uh, engraved to look like him or not, we don't know. But three Hebrews stood in front of that image and they stood straight and tall. And those three Hebrews were larger than Nebuchadnezzar and larger than that great tall image, much larger because they stood they stood for Jesus Christ. They were bigger in mind. They were bigger in morality. They were bigger in every way than that great image. We might build any kind of image that we like in our mind and have it as large as we like, but that image is worth nothing unless we see ourselves standing with Jesus Christ. Unless we see ourselves standing with the God of the universe, the God, the creator God, unless we see ourselves standing with him, then we are in a state of imagination and deception. Nebuchadnezzar was greatly deceived. Let's go on and read a little bit more. Then Nebuchadnezzar, verse 13, Then Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and fury, commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now, if you are ready at uh, what time you hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbot, the psaltery, and the dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the image which I have made, well, but if you worship not, you will be cast the same hour into the midst of the burning fiery furnace, and who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? And I imagine Nebuchadnezzar gave a sly little grin and thought to himself, this will make them bow down. What God can save you out of my hands? Notice what he says. What God can save you out of my God's, my God hands? Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we're not afraid to answer you in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto you, O king, that we shall not serve your gods nor worship the golden image which you have set up. They made an emphatic statement. 
It doesn't matter what you do, king. We will not worship this image. We will not worship a human being. We will not worship any other than the God of creation. Then Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury. In the form of his visage, it says here in the old-fashioned English, his face changed from one of being a little smart, I suppose, to one of being absolutely furious. His teeth clenched and a frown across his forehead. And uh, he said to them <coughs> that they should, he said they should heat the furnace seven times hotter than it needed to be. He was taking no chances with this God of uh, these three Hebrews. These three Hebrews <coughs> were a real threat to him. Any sort of a furnace would have been enough to consume three Hebrews as it would you and I, because these furnaces were furnaces that were used for melting down brass and the such like. And uh, when they pumped them up to their normal heat, they were quite sufficient to melt the buckles off your belt if you happened to be thrown into the fire. Well, <clears throat> seven times hotter than it needed to be, the fire was heated up. Verse 21, these men were bound in their coats, their hose and their hats and their other garments and were cast into the middle of the fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent and the furnace exceeding hot, the flame of the fire slew those men that took them up. So uh, we, uh, we sort of feel a little bit uh, good about this part of it, don't we? Because these bad guys who had been bowing down to this uh, idol of Nebuchadnezzar, at least however many number it was of them, there's probably six or eight of them or whatever it was, um, they were killed just from the heat that radiated off the furnace without even going into it. <coughs> These three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bound into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. I'm interested in that little phrase, fell down, bound, in the midst of the fiery furnace. I would like to think, and I think there is good reason ling uh, linguistically to believe that this term fell down meant that they voluntarily bowed down in the midst of that fiery furnace. They bowed down to their God. Because something astonishing happened, for when Nebuchadnezzar looked to see what was taking place in verse 21, he was astonished, and he rose up in haste, and he spake and said to his counsellors, didn't we cast three men bound up into the midst of the fire? And they answered the king, true, O king. And he answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire and they have no hurt and the f form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Who's the Son of God? The Son of God is Jesus. You know, some people have said Jesus was not known in the Old Testament, but I want to assure you he was. Jesus was known in the Old Testament. They knew who the Son of God was. And somehow Nebuchadnezzar had learned what the Son of God was like. The Son of God was identifiable as the Son of God. It was Jesus himself. In the middle of the fiery furnace, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had done their obeisance, made their prayer to God, and God had listened, and Jesus had come to stand beside them in the fiery furnace. We like the story because... It makes the baddies like Nebuchadnezzar and the others look bad and it makes the Jews like Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego look good. But that's not why the story is told. The story is told because God wants us to realize that when we stand for him, we are worshipping to the highest degree. Standing for Jesus is like bowing low in worship and obeisance to him. Worshipping Jesus, worshipping God, worshipping Jesus, standing up for Jesus is the highest form of worship. We may go through rituals, we may do all kinds of things, we may sing songs and do all sorts of things that we call worship, but when it comes to the final analysis, standing up for Jesus Christ is the highest form of worship. 
We can sing songs and not believe a word of them. We can leave church today and not even remember the hymns that we sung. You can go from church today and not even remember the sermon. And the other day I asked them up at uh, Tiki Punga, and no, uh, nothing against the Tiki Punga folk, but I uh, asked them up there what I preached about last time I was there and nobody could, could uh, remember it. And uh, I'd actually asked Lorraine before I went up there, I said, what did I preach about last time I went up there? And she couldn't remember either. <laughs> nothing against Lorraine. <laughs> She's got enough to do, do without listening to my sermons. And then she said, why do you ask? <laughs> now, that was a tough one. Why did I ask? Because I didn't remember either. And I had to have a look in my book. You know, we might think we've worshipped God in all kinds of sincere ways, and we can go away and forget all about what we did in that worship. But the real worship of God is when we stand up for him when things go tough for us. That's what real worship is all about. The real worship of God is standing up for Jesus. Let's go down to verse 28. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him and have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. And then he made a decree that nobody should say a word against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were to honour and respect the God of the Hebrews. Three men who stood up for Jesus. It saved their lives. And eventually, of course, they became governors and rulers in the territory that Nebuchadnezzar ruled over. <coughs> Wouldn't it be good to be able to look down the history of the Christian church and be able to say that everyone who has had some association with Jesus stood up for him at every twist and every turn. In every difficulty and in every tough spot, they stood up for Jesus. You know, we don't always achieve our objectives. We don't always do what we hope and plan that we will do. And when something hits us all of a sudden, we sometimes find to our regret that we haven't stood up for Jesus as we thought we should. We always think that we will be like Stephen. We think, I'll be like Stephen. And when the hard times come, I will stand up for Jesus and when they're throwing stones at me, I will see a picture of the glories of heaven up there and uh, I will be a witness for him. Doesn't always work that way, unfortunately. Sometimes, of course, we're more like Paul. I'll stand up for my God who I don't really understand properly and I'll go and persecute those people. I'll give them a hard time because they're not doing what they ought to do according to me. But Paul realised what he thought he was standing up for was really, would really be his downfall. And eventually Paul stood up for Jesus and Paul becomes one of the authors of the Bible who gives us the best understanding of the plan of salvation that we can find in all of the scripture. Jesus wanted his disciples to stand up for him. He was in the Garden of Gethsemane. He knew that his time was short, that his life would soon be taken from him, and in his humanity he wanted someone to stand up for him. He took Peter and James and John with him. We won't look up the reference in Matthew 26. He took Peter and James and John with him, and uh, he said, let's come aside and pray for a while. And Jesus prayed, and when he... Uh, had a little interlude in his prayer. He looked at his disciples and they were sound asleep. They'd had a hard day, like I had a hard week. They were sound asleep. And he woke them up and said, couldn't you watch me just for a little while, just an hour or so? Jesus wanted someone to stand beside him. And so they tried, but it didn't work very well. And Jesus prayed again, another little interlude in his prayer. And uh, he looks around and they're all asleep. Apparently they'd all gathered together by this time. They were all asleep and all drowsy. Not really, suppose, understanding exactly what Jesus was going through, but after being with him for three years, they must have had a fair idea 
that Jesus was going through a very traumatic time. And yet they were so drowsy. Jesus wanted someone to stand with him through his toughest hour. Peter, of course, said, well, you'll be right now. I'm wide awake now. And uh, when they came to get Jesus, Peter was wide awake. He was going to stand up for Jesus, all right. And Peter had never got rid of that little sword, that little dagger that he carried with him. Of course, I suppose Peter always suggested he took it with him in case he had to cut open a coconut or something or other. Well, he didn't just aim at coconuts, he aimed at heads as well. And, of course, he missed and he cut off the servant of the high priest's ear. Peter was going to stand up for Jesus, but this wasn't what Jesus really wanted. Jesus doesn't want us to stand up for him in militancy and in crusades and that kind of thing. Jesus wants us to stand up with him in moral uprightness. To stand with him in principle. To stand with him and represent him even though things might be going tough. He wants us to stand with him when things are going tough in our lives, when things are going tough in our families, when things are going tough in our domestic situation, when things are going tough with our finances. Jesus wants us to stand with him and stand by the principles of his kingdom. And when things go tough with the church, he wants us to stand with him. I had an experience with a couple some quite a few years ago now who wanted me to come and see them and they said they wanted to resign from the Adventist church. And I said, why ever do you want to do that? You've both been Adventists for years and years. And they said, well, we understand that the Adventist church uh, uh, is going to be in trouble uh, in the future and uh, we might have all our property taken away from us simply because we're Seventh-day Adventists. And uh, I said, well, so what? And they said, well, we, we don't want our property taken away and if, we, uh, if we're not officially Seventh-day Adventists, um, they won't take our property away from us. So you people lose all your property, but we'll keep ours and, and we'll be able to survive. And I said to them, well, don't you have faith that the Lord will provide for you? Jesus didn't own any property and he got through all right and uh, had a big long talk. But anyway, I couldn't talk them out of it. And I said, well, look, do you like people to stand by you when you have tough times? And they said, yeah, I suppose we do, yeah. Because I happen to know that one of the brothers of the, the wife had actually stood by them and financed them in a difficult situation. And they agreed that was true. And I said, well, wouldn't you stand up for Jesus when the church goes through a tough time? And uh, they were not convinced. I couldn't convince them. And so they resigned their membership of the church and be assured they have gone down and down and down in every way since that time. When the church is having a tough time, Jesus says, stand up for me. Jesus wants us to stand for him, whatever the circumstance. He wants us to stand for him, not just through <coughs> his Gethsemane experience with those disciples, because that was a unique experience that will never occur again in history. Never will you have to stand the same as those disciples were asked to stand with him prior to his crucifixion. But he wants you to stand for him in your workplace, in your relationships with others, in your business, <clears throat> with honesty and reliability and integrity. He wants you to stand with him in your lifestyle. He wants you to stand with him in the way you live, the way you dress, the way you eat. He wants you to stand with him the way you socialize. He wants you to stand with him against the perversions and the evils that we find in the world today. He wants you to stand with him in correctness of teaching of scripture. We call them doctrines, the teachings of the scripture. He wants you to stand with him in conversation. He wants you to stand with him in religious activity. And I could go on and on and on. If I did, it would only be oratory and not, uh, not make any more sense to you than that. Jesus wants us to stand with him. Why? Because in standing for him, we are worshipping him at the highest level. Standing for Jesus is the highest form of worship. And I challenge you today, are you prepared to worship Jesus in the highest possible form? If you are, you will stand for him because standing for him 
is bowing low at Jesus' feet. We're going to sing our closing hymn. It's <laughs> number 618 if you're using the hymn book. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. And without a pun, I'll ask you to stand for this hymn. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we acknowledge today and regret that we have not always stood up for you as we should have done. We have let you down. But we, like the disciples of old, have received your forgiveness and your grace and your mercy is sufficient for us. We pray that you'll help us in our lives in every aspect that we will stand for you and worship you in the highest possible manner. Dismiss us with your blessing and again give us the assurance that our salvation is found in Jesus our Saviour. We pray, please, for Jesus' sake. Amen.